Now, all of you that know so know that that's typical. Yeah. So, all right. So we're working on that. Um, so just as a little bit of introduction, I'm the um, chairman of the specialist group on interactivity, interactivity for ATSC3. Um, so I know all these guys sort of in that role. And uh, Peter asked me to put this together. And so I called up my friends and, and family from the interactive squad. And, and so here, here's where these guys are coming from. You are leading um, that part of the What's that? You are leading part of the um, I don't know about leading this part. I'm the <laughs> chair of the committee that's writing about what goes into yes. the standard. I don't know about leading, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, so the first, first up is, uh, is Greg, and they've been doing a bunch. So we've sort of staged this on things that are happening now, um, things that are sort of midterm, uh, which will be uh, Pete and myself, and then sort of the long-term vision, which is so. And what we really wanted to do is have the panel so folks can ask about this. As, as you've heard all day long, a lot of the features of ATSC3 are really based on, and we have a requirements list, and you'd be surprised the number of them are actually fulfilled by the applications. Um, so there's a lot of features that we had in the, in the standard that we were trying to meet by writing, writing specification. And it turned out when we tried to figure out what the fulfillment was, uh, a lot of them are actually fulfilled by people building applications to make it work. Um, and so you're going to see people up here, not myself particularly, we have done some stuff in that space, but these guys are really focused on that. Um, and so you'll see that. So let's keep okay. going with Greg. Thank you. So hi, my name is Greg Jarvis from the, uh, the FinCons group. Uh, when Mark came to us, he said, let's just show what's possible, right? Kind of go out there a bit. So I'm going to talk a bit about things into the future. Right, and kind of cool, show some kind of cool new stuff. But I wanted to give you some perspective because it's funny, I've spoken at many of these things and I own, always only seem to know 10% of the audience. So there's 90% that's, that's new. Um, so I did, FinCon's group and even myself are very heavy in the OTT space, okay? FinCon's group in Europe has been deploying HPV TV apps since the beginning of HPV TV apps and have things in production there. So we took those two things, those two concepts, and said, let's approach the, the US. So for the last few years, uh, two years in particular, we have been deploying proof of concepts, tests, markets, different things here in the US around uh, ATSC or next gen TV apps. Right? So we have that context. What's in production now versus you know, how it's being used in the US? So I wanted to kind of introduce at least the context that where we come from. The, so for the last couple of years, we started out and I said, okay, let's take and just see if it works from the app perspective. And I say the app perspective, I mean from what a user would actually use perspective, right? We all have, we're all engineers and we do test screens and they have a whole bunch of data on the screen and really the engineers are the only ones that know what it does. But the station manager wants to kind of get an idea. I mean, I change channel, what happens, right? So we. Our piece of this world has been building those apps and those platforms that are there. We started out just proving that it worked, okay? A couple years back, right? Then we started adding functionality. Is that a program guide? What does that look like? What's, what's uh, you know, the, uh, a channel guide? What, is, what does that look like, right? And just get into some of the basic functionality, move then into detailed uh, uh, proof of concepts and actual testing. So as we went around to all the different sites, we're testing what? The, what's coming over the air, we're testing the TV manufacturers, but we're doing it in an actual environment that, you know, it could be an actual app that's out there. This past year and recently, we're doing full functional apps, right? And when you say apps, a lot of it is particular to the content, okay? There's a base core of apps that are changing the channel, program guides, you know, navigation. But then per what we see is per content. So when you have reality TV, you're voting on the winner, right? When you have sports, you're seeing the data. Things that are related to the content are really some of the apps that, uh, that we're seeing. And I say full functional apps, that's what I mean. And then as we go into this year, you know, we're, we're working with a number of you to actually produce the apps that go into production and all the goodness that goes with it. So I always kind of like to throw this in, you know, especially I'm an engineer too, but very simply put, Again, this is, an, this is a browser, right? It's lots of details and specifics, and there's good software developers, and there's bad ones that can goof up a browser. And there's apps that are slow, there's apps that are fast, but 
big picture, it's a browser. It's an invisible browser. It runs HTML5 code, right? The, the URLs are triggered from the stream. You can go to broadband. The data can come from broadcast, OK? Big picture, that's what it is. So just a couple slides on what do we see today, right? What's out there, both in Europe and the different uh, hybrid TV apps that are there. And what do we see? What are we being asked to do? What do we see being launched? Okay. Very simply, you have display advertising, right? Which is relatively new. It's the, it's the pop-up and various versions of that. Um, learned a lot of lessons along the way. You have L bars. You have things that are popping up, contextually popping up. Um, big lesson learned that just seems obvious is people don't like to click a button and suddenly their show stop and a car ad come up. <laughs> like, oh. Imagine that, right? So <laughs> a lot of ads are being, you know, saved for later. People will watch them for later. We'll watch them later. You know, so we created watch list kinds of things. Video advertising, every pre-roll, or every VOD asset essentially gets a pre-roll, right? This is something that's relatively new. And then as the digital advertising goes with it, um, you know, some interesting anecdotal information. As we, you know, I just did a report on kind of what's happening now that our, some of our customers have been on air for a couple of years with HPB TV, and about a quarter of their broadband views, content coming from broadband, are start over or restart, right? And every one of those they put they, they put an ad on. So, um, you know, the the, the the things that are in market um, that are interesting um, is is, is kind of where we're at today because they're about two years ahead. But program navigation, basic functionality. Uh, like Pete's going to talk about just some standardizations to do that. Uh, user interface and usability, extremely, probably the most important thing, right? Uh, as there is some countries that deploy the per broadcaster model, and each one has their own app. Each one has their own interface. I was in Europe, and I was in one of those countries. They had three major broadcasters in one service that's good for all of them, okay? Each broadcaster, as I changed channels, each had about six or eight channels. As I got to a different one, it looked completely different. One had a bottom row navigation. One had them over in the left. One had just this kind of odd big arrows on the side. I had no idea what I was doing. Right? <laughs> so much so that I had my colleague get my phone out and take it. I said, you got to take a picture of this. This is there. Record this. This is crazy. Right? We have another country we work with where it's a consortium. Right? And there's a reason for this. but. There's a consortium where it's the same user interface for your basic navigation, right? How do you see? There's some core functionality, works the same. Uh, we call it the, 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 the red button, green button. The red button works the same for everybody, no matter what channel you're on. The green button is unique content, unique services that you have, unique to, to, to what it is that you're broadcasting. So we're designing here in the US, not for any colored buttons, so <laughs> we call it the horizontal plane and the vertical plane, right? So user experience, very important. And then lastly, video on demand. So one form or another, okay? Probably the most popular has been in what you would call binge watching, right? Or you may also like. What a surprise, huh? So similar to an OTT experience, you're watching a show, if there's the next episode or similar content, Instead of having them, if you specifically, if the next linear show is much different, so you're going from a crime drama to sports, right? You don't like sports, you're going to change the channel. So stickiness is we're popping up something at the end, so you may also like showing a few options that are available through broadband. Or if it so works out that this is a particular series, you can watch the next episode, other episodes, behind the scenes, things like that, that keep the user engaged on the particular network. Next, this is what we're seeing now and things that are pushing forward as technology is being incorporated. And again, a couple years into it, people are getting used to it. And data being the most important thing, data comes from people being engaged. So now that they have a interaction with the consumer, with their viewers, their, their appetite for data is strong, right? We want to see what people are doing. We, are constantly re uh, pushing new apps, new ideas, new things to get people to push on buttons. It's surprising, but these are literally weekly, sometimes daily, depending on the content. They're pushing new things to get people to interact with the television. 
This is a couple years in, so don't get scared right away, right? They didn't do that at the beginning, right? They started slow, ease into it, use their experience. So contextual ads. So this little picture is an airport. They show uh, an airline ad. Augmented overlays, so data that's coming over the, over the TV screen that's related to the actual content uh, as they're pointing out, you know, this is the car, you know, the bubble up thing. Smart watching, really interesting because this is using essentially artificial intelligence, scans through the content and finds various elements and then the viewer can then skip forward to just those spots. And probably the best one is an award show. Right, so you only wanted to watch a certain person's speech. It's a three hour award show. You can skip forward to that person's speech. Things of that nature, okay. Sports, there's ways to determine when the goal was scored automatically. And you can skip forward to all the goals. Things of that nature. These are being trialed right now. Contest embedding, uh, hugely engaging. And I'm actually gonna show a little demo of what we're doing there. Hugely engaging to have the viewer actually interact and be part of of the contest, who's going to win, right? What's the score going to be? Uh, who do you think is going to get kicked off the island? You know, all, all of these things. And then leaderboards and things that allow them to stay engaged and to have some vested interest to watch to the end. E-commerce, um, you know, people have been trying for 20 years to try and figure out a way to buy the guy's sweater on the TV. Well, this is starting to come in. The, uh, we're, we're, there's, you know, recipes. You know, buy the, the content online and the cooking show, things of that nature are, you know, being discussed. And then lastly, smart watching, particular to, uh, you know, movies and genres, or movies and TV shows. Okay, so that's the layout. I'm going to show you, I got about a five minute video of some of the different apps that, that we've done. This is, you know, again, what's possible. But I, they're relatively self explanatory, but I wanted to kind of set it up a little bit. The, very beginning uh, is an app. It's just basic navigation, right? The things we talked about. How do you get around? What does the display advertising look like? Second part of that is around uh, using AI for uh, uh, content recognition and allowing you to skip forward into it. And you know, we, you know, we realize this is a slow roll, and these are things being pushed out. But these is the type of things that could be done. So that is my, my piece. Well, uh, we'll have uh, plenty of time at the end for uh, questions. We've got about an hour long here for the, the four of us to do our thing. And, and then we'll have probably 20, 25 minutes at the end for folks to ask questions and, and have essentially a panel discussion. So be thinking about things you want to ask us and, and questions you want to pose during this. And uh, we'll get to it at the end. I have some some questions at the end, too, if, in case nobody uh, comes up with something. So. Great. Um, so my name is Pete Van Fien, and I'm with Pearl TV. And I'm going to talk about some of the things to kind of enable all that cool stuff that you just saw. Um, and most of this is coming out of the Phoenix model market. And I'll kind of explain some of that uh, as we start off here. Um, so who is Pearl? I know probably a third of you may know what Pearl, who Pearl is, and the rest of you probably don't. Uh, basically, it's a business org that's funded by eight of the station groups that you see below. And it's particular to this sort of topic, um, Pearl funded a lot of activity in the standards to help represent broadcasters and then uh, carry forward to do a lot of testing and help roll out the service uh, across all of our member stations. Um, and a big part of our activity and my, my involvement really for the last two years now has been working in Phoenix where we have a single stick up with a 12 different station groups, which I'll show you here in a second. Um, but it's a, it's a model market. So we, we did this years ago with MH and said, hey, let's go to one market, let's figure out how all this stuff works and then carry, carry it on. And this are, these are some of the things that, that, uh, that to describe what's happening in the, the model market. It's an open test bed. Um, so we have all kinds of uh, vendor, equipment vendors and OEMs and broadcasters that are participating. Um, we're really trying to develop what is that basic TV service on next gen? Because uh, there's all these things you can do, but really what is a basic service? Uh, testing consumer uh, propositions. Uh, we're doing a lot with cable, which isn't really relevant to this, this uh, interactivity thing, but just to let you know what the scope is. Um, and the key thing is we're, we're developing a set of frameworks for transitioning stations and actually getting services up and running. And so one of the things that we've done um, is put together an application framework. 
Um, here are some of the, the folks that are involved in the model market. Um, it includes not only uh, the pro member stations, but uh, NBC, uh, Fox, and Univision as well. Um, so the, the effort that we undertook to put together our framework um, is, is related, really related to that, that core group of broadcasters that are in Phoenix. Um, last thing to say about Phoenix, it, these are all the people involved. So again, it isn't just uh, the broadcasters. We have a ton of partners. Uh, FinCons has been around this uh, NAB pilots that helped with a lot of it. And then we have equipment vendors and, and a lot of the, the major OEMs. Um, and we've just done a ton of tra transmission testing too, re related to that basic TV service. It's not a, it's not a it's sort of an experimental thing from an engineering standpoint, but really, what's the service going to be? How does it work? How does it operate? Um, and what do we? And again, what it's going to take to roll it out? Um, so, so what we did is we we said, you know, we want to make sure that when we when we think about these applications, that they all run consistently, and it's it's in a sort of sort of a uh, common way of, of deploying it. And what we, we wanted to avoid, and all the partners in Phoenix uh, kind of agree that you want to have one set of, fr of a framework so that you don't have to do a lot of extra testing and that you have consistency of the user experience. Um, so in not only navigation, but in the behavior. Um, if you have a lot of different frameworks running around, you may have different start times, just basic different user experiences. And I think as Greg had mentioned, you know, they've kind of learned the hard way uh -huh. from Europe that you got to kind of have your act together and you have to work collaboratively, collaboratively so you don't confuse the consumers. Um, again, enable innovation. This is an early stage, right? So you want to put enough in these frameworks so that people can actually innovate on it. Uh, very, very important. Um, again, part the other half of my job is working with the major CEs and they've all said, look, you guys need to get together and, and try to minimize the, the duplication and on all these different platforms. We want to kind of come to have one place where we can test to get assurance that all this stuff is going to run. So one of our goals really was to minimize the CE device test burden. And that's not only on them, but it's on us as well as application developers. Um, and then again, you know, again for you know financially, um, it's it makes a lot of sense for us to pull together and have a common framework so we're not duplicating effort all over the place. Um, okay, so uh, just sort of a, a little bit of a, a cake chart um, of. The things involved for the for the applications, right? So, you've, starting from the bottom, you get the ATS receiver that cares for a lot of the underpinnings for these services, uh, and then we layer in this common component framework that does another level of, level of things, and then on top of that, you overlay the things you just saw from Greg. Uh, you got a common UI, and then you got broadcaster applications and maybe specific to things like sports betting. Um, and then on, on the right, you've got things that kind of enable all those things. There's a lot of cloud-based stuff, whether it's VOD serving. Uh, whether it's program guide information, um, there's content that's coming from other places, application management, there's some level of security and protection, um, and then ad delivery. So there's there's all of these things that have to play in order to make <coughs> Greg just show work. And, and um, so in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the framework and the application. So working from the top down, so some of the things that we think are important in a common application, Greg, you alluded to a lot of this, I think, earlier, so I won't belabor the points, but um, there is like a first time user experience. So when a consumer opens up their brand new next gen TV, what's that first time user experience like? Um, so that's important that that's sort of consistent uh, across all the different apps and, and stations and broadcasters. Um, call to action. So if you want to bring up an interactive screen, what do you, what button? Do you, as you mentioned, we don't have the red button here, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? You don't want to have to retrain uh, consumers for each broadcaster or for each market, for each TV brand. You want that to be consistent. Um, a home screen menu, the navigation of when you bring things up, how do you get to the next spot? Um, and things things that were implemented early on was, you know, the, the logos and styles, you want that to be sort of consistent in the same place uh, where the channel the channel is and maybe a local time display. Uh, app, it's picking the right language for the app so that the, so the, the user, if it's a Spanish speaking household and they've already picked preferences, you, you render the, the application in, in their language, right? So they don't have to go and hunt and peck for it. Um, Things like closed captioning, um, and then there's things that are sort of what is what is each broadcaster going to support? So if you pick in any given market that's deploying next gen TV, you may have four or five stations, right? Um, they may want to highlight different things. Some people may want to do something that's very elaborate. Some people may want to do something very uh, very sort of minimalistic. Uh, but but that those are the sort of things that are from an application standpoint um, that that would be common. Some of the things we think that you know, given the newsroom and the importance on weather. Um, that were kind of built in early uh, was a weather widget, access to VOD clips, things that people want to see, the extra content they want to see, um, 
alerting displays. So what is that, that? I think going back to the AWAR conversation, you know, what is that? What does that mechanism look like? You don't want, again, you don't want people to be confused about what they're seeing, especially when you're talking about either informational or emergency alerts. And then, then things like polling and voting. Those are all sort of the common set of things that we think most people will want to at least test out with. So that's that's the application. And then you've got a, a set of framework, which is really the plumbing, right? And there's there's a lot of uh, linkages between these two. Um, but uh, the things that, that we built into the framework that we're testing with right now include things like lifecycle management. So lifecycle meaning the lifecycle of the apps. You change the channel, what happens? You, 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 you exit uh, and you have to go to a, a new service, what happens? Uh, when do you close things down? Uh, what do you keep in cash? That kind of stuff. Um, also content protection, as you guys know, like Next Gen TV has, uh, has enabled content protection and the application can participate in some of the behaviors around that. Um, message handling. So when, when the receiver wants to message the app, how does all that happen? You want that to be consistent for your, your, your developers so that they don't have to relearn it every time they, they go to a different uh, set of uh, capabilities. Um, the remote control navigation, really important. You know, what buttons are you going to use? What buttons are available? Um, the, the framework handles all that. Um, instrumentation within the application so that you know so you know, as an operator, we want to make, know, is it working right? Have we had, have they had the, the browser crashed? Those sort of instrumentation things so that you can monitor sort of the health of the, the application itself. Um, authentication, uh, having common ways to authenticate. Some people have talked about maybe enabling certain features only for MVPD customers because you want to help protect those retrans revenues. Uh, so in the plumbing of the framework, that's one of the, one of the other key capability. Uh, the alerting controls, what kind of alerts do you even want on the surface? Um, it's sort of that in-between layer between the receiver and the application. Uh, again, monitoring what's the, what's the language selection, what's the content rating of the content? So there's a, there's a layer in there that kind of handles all of that. Um, some, some level of streaming playback controls. For some of those of you that have been around, uh, you know there, there's a receiver media player and an application media player, and there's different playback controls. Um, and even different video rendering that, that you have to handle. So there's, there's things we've kind of had to, had to learn through to uh, we figure we would push into the framework so that you wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. Uh, things like identity management, uh, privacy control, pri privacy controls, uh, that layer where you're interfacing with the receivers. Some, sometimes the receivers have a little bit of nuances, uh, so you can kind of hide some of that within the framework. Um, connectivity and resource management, really important. Again, these are TVs, right? And they are smart TVs, but they're not always connected. Some people never connect them. So you have to, you have, to have some awareness of your connectivity state in order to render certain features. So again, this is sort of the plumbing that we built in. Um, and then uh, video controls, which is really kind of the same thing as the, the playback controls. So there's a there's the receiver, you got the framework, and then you got the, the common apps. And then as part of this sort of development activity, there's a bunch of extra stuff that helps helps you enable uh, application development. Uh, one is you know being able to emulate a receiver. If, unless you, if you don't have a receiver for this to run on, uh, you will shortly uh, after CES. Uh, but you want to manage all the stuff within your PC. Um, you need tools to help, help enable that. Uh, being able to exercise the APIs and make sure that the APIs are actually doing what they, you think they said. These are, these are sort of ancillary things that we've rolled out with, with this framework. Um, some starter home screen and basic apps and widgets just so people can play and exercise. Um, a set of conversion tools. A lot of the, uh, the stuff that we have on our digital properties are all on MRSS and it's a little more, it's a little easier to handle from an app development standpoint using JSON. So we built a set of tools to, to help do those sort of conversions. Um, we've also spent a fair amount of time on common uh, uh, terms for privacy and um, in terms of the terms of service, and again, this is this is more sort of lawyer work, but it's service services that we kind of gone down behind the uh, uh, behind the scenes, uh, and then you know, in terms of enabling people able to do this stuff, doing a lot of onboarding, uh, we've done workshops, and then we also have fairly extensive sort of what we call zoo testing, where you have all the devices uh, in one place, and you can exercise uh, just kind of out in the wild almost, just uh, uh, very repetitive, very automated, but making sure that. Um, especially in these early days, working with each one of the, the major CE vendors to make sure that they're building the right kind of product and that the application and the framework supports the features of their, their TVs. Um, so other things to consider. So, right, so we talked about all this cool stuff. We talked about some of the, the software that has, and the stacks that have to be there. 
but just as broadcasters, things you also need to think about, right, is there's all this other IP stuff that comes along with it. So there's a little bit of a transformation that's happening, right? And the station itself, the equipment room, isn't all just SDI and stuff. It's, it's a ton of IP. You've got IP switches, you've got virtual machines, uh, you've got uh, application servers and things like that to push things to the application. Um, in order for the application to do what you want it to do, but have it more automated, you want to tie into a content management system. Um, and then maybe even the play out and automation systems in order to, to get the right sort of user experience. Um, there's origin servers, right, to be able to um, serve up all these VOD clips that you, that you want to provide access to. Um, and the other key thing is that when you look at the digital properties and a lot of the early testing I think we've all done is we kind of tie into that stuff and you render these, these great videos, but they're formatted for a tablet or a phone and you're putting it on a 65 inch TV with a 10, 10 foot viewing uh, window, you need to start thinking about these assets need to be rendered differently. Um, uh, and the other things like ad decisioning and serving, another set of infrastructure that's required. And, uh, and, and as much as you enable service and content protection, um, there's back-end services all uh, very internet friendly uh, for that. And then uh, service monitoring. If you're gonna put this stuff up in front of people, you know, want to know that it's working. So you may wanna monitor all the components that, that, are, that are making it happen, but also at the end of the day, monitor that user experience. Um, so these are all things that kind of come with all this goodness. It's not all free, but uh, you know, as part of this framework discussion, I wanted to just kind of get that in front of you because these are things that we're all learning as we're, we're building all this stuff out and testing it over in Phoenix. I think that's all I had. I kind of ran through that pretty quick, but hopefully you get the idea. This was a sitting chair, right? I got like oh, that one in front. Yeah. I'll go next. And I'd like to thank uh, John Wachowski, the inspector rep, for having done most of these slides. <laughs> it turns out, so uh, since every, a lot of people are AWARN um, folks, I was gonna talk about what work has been done in the AEA space, and you'll notice a lot of similarity from what John talked about earlier. Uh, in fact, some of the slides are exactly the same, believe it or not, and we did not work together. So <laughs> AWARN is actually succeeding uh, to some degree. All right. Um, so this was a little background about AEA. This is also what was on John's slide, so uh, apologize. But this is kind of a review. So you need to know about information, emergency alerting. Um, so it's good to have this brought in front of you multiple times, I claim. Um, <clears throat> and so most of this is basically similar. Uh, again, uh, emergency alert or emergency alert notifications, the EA stuff, EAS stuff, EAN. You still have to do that. Stations will probably include a burned in banner just to make sure that they can hit things that don't do the information side of the world. Um, but one would guess those emergencies are still gonna be burned in banners. Um, the AEA, and we call it AEA, uh, you'll notice the capital A, it's actually emergency information. Um, the, that AEA is optional and supplemental to today's practices. Uh, so again, this is just reiterating that message. Um, but basically, it's an ability for broadcasters to deliver more information, uh, get in front, get have the newsroom, have the folks that are in charge of the news, having the local people be able to interact with your uh, consumers, fundamentally. So what's the AA features? And again, this is redundant. Um, the wake-up field, um, John talked about that quite a bit. Carried in the bootstrap. Um, there's an emergency alert information table. Um, <clears throat> and that's basically what the receiver would know. Now this actually gets pushed up into the interactivity. So the point of having it here in this discussion, in this panel, is that interactivity, uh, when you actually go for the information, uh, interactivity information, and this displays the AWARN uh, slides that you saw, um, and I'll show them again, um, but those that held table, which is what the uh, information tells the broadcaster application to launch, fires up the framework, does all the stuff that Pete was just talking about, those apps run and in that layer. Uh, so the signaling, the interactivity is, is part and parcel of the emergency alert information uh, mechanisms that are interacting with the user. Um, and again, watermarks are also critical because they can allow an ATSC3 receiver to work in an MVPD environment uh, so that it can actually start up and load all of this stuff independent of the cable uh, distribution. So, Really the point uh, that dovetails nicely with what uh, John was talking about is that we were chartered by So and his crew and the pilot folks uh, to build what we refer to as a template manager. So 
So John talked about templates. Um, and you really have to think about it. An emergency comes in, um, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time formatting a display, right? Formatting, figuring out how all that stuff lays out, what's going on. You really need a set of um, sort of targeted templates that you can just say, oh, I know what that is. Let me drop this stuff in here, some quick information, and boom, off it goes. You want to be able to produce that very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so what we did was create a set of APIs into our software, uh, into our distribution software, um, and a set of open source software that Pilot will be distrib distributing. I think it's actually up now. I'm not entirely sure. So yeah, it's available for folks that are part of NEB. Um, and it enables a workflow for AEA templates, um, consistent with look and feel and interactivity that AWARN proposed, uh, their user experience recommendations, which is why you'll see exactly what those other slides look like. Um, the AEA triggering is based on active AEAT information, um, and as well as the associated media that may come in from external sources or from a local newsroom. Um, and you can uh, add augmented uh, media, um, live feeds, things of that nature. Um, there was a mechanism where you actually could push through like a Twitter feed, a curated Twitter feed, for example, and have that updated on the display. We won't show an example of that, but um, that's one of the things that we can do. Um, and then everything is delivered in band. No uh, out of band is required. That was one of the key things we wanted here, uh, including the feeds for up to date, you know, sort of a Twitter feed or a news feed. Um, all of that was to be delivered in band in case somebody didn't have, in an emergency situation, might actually not have uh, OTT uh, capability or uh, broadband capability. So that was another key aspect of these requirements. So this is what it looks like. Uh, the top half, the gray stuff, is essentially just. Uh, I don't say just, but the ATSC3, the next gen TV uh, broadcast chain. So you see, uh, or really through, there's ATBC audio encoders, OTT packaging, um, the transport encoder, which is the thing that does the router MMT, um, adds signaling, adds a number of other items, does the, uh, uh, you know, basically all of that techniques, signatures, things of that nature. Uh, pushes it to the scheduler and exciter, off to the transmitter, and then out to the receiver. Uh, on the bottom half, you'll see the uh, internet distribution path. And uh, here's where we added what we refer to as the AEA manager. There's a server and then a client. It's just a web-based client. Um, some snapshots. So that could actually be plugged in. Um, the way it's set up, it's a very uh, sort of an experiment, proof of concept in some respects. Um, that folks could use to either integrate with a new system, put into their newsroom, or just start building out this stuff and start experimenting with it and see what they really want to do with it. That was really the goal, was to try to, to get people thinking about this, put it into their workflows, and see if they could actually start working with it. So this is just a display, a uh, browser, typical browser. Um, you'll see on the left hand here are things that you can pick, um, media types that you can put in. Uh, uh, cleverly put some file, but you could put media in, you could put uh, a variety of things. You'll see this level layer of the execution or evacuation map in the shelters. This is exactly the same demo that John, that John showed. This was actually being done live though. So there's a live video running in the background. Um, and this would be the notice that you could put up. So you could drag and drop this in place, create whatever you wanted to. Um, the next one shows the build out of the evacuation um, maps where to avoid, we saw this before. So this is just basically laying all of that stuff out. It drops into an NRT channel over the broadcast. There's actually three channels, one's live, and there's some updates, and that's continuously operating, and then ultimately lands on the receiver. So this is the display, you've seen this before. You can pick, you know, this, was, this would be what would be on the receiver in an interactive mode, and you could select either the evacuation map, the shelters, uh, you could dismiss it, um, and it worked basically the way John described. Um, again, here's your location. Um, and so that's, that's basically, uh, the, the key here though is that there was a tool created, you can gain access to that tool, you can start experimenting with that tool and that software, uh, it's open source, so you can actually start uh, changing it if you like and integrating it in various environments. So that's all I had uh, and we'll off to sew. <laughs> Switch my mic on. No.
I'm good, right? Yep, I hear you. Okay. Do you hear me? I'm clicking forward. All right. I thought I was going to go before you, and then you switched it up on me. Yeah. Like well, the, good, good, the, good, the good news for me is that I'm not behind a podium. A short guy in podium don't go well <laughs> together. <you know? laughs> so anyway, well, thanks, thanks everybody. And, uh, and thanks, Mark, for inviting me to, uh, to, to talk a little bit about what we've been doing. Uh, my name is So Vang um, with the NAB. Uh, been there a couple of years now. Well, actually, seems like a couple of years, but a lot more than that, actually. Um, so some of the things, I'm, uh, it's good that these guys went, went ahead of me because what I'm going to do is talk a little, bit, a little bit about probably things that we will be doing further out. Uh, and if not, that's what I really meant, <laughs> you know, yeah, because uh, I know that right now we're, we are very much focused on the 2020, sort of the near term, how do we get everything off the ground. And for those of you who went to CES, there certainly uh, there's a, there, there was a lot of announcement in terms of 3.0 next gen that's very optimistic. And we're uh, now that, uh, you know, there's going to be multiple uh, TV models out there with uh, you know, going to be in the market with uh, with 3.0 or 3.0 compliant. Now it's really up to broadcasters to sort of you know start to get things uh, lit up. So anyway, some of the topics I'm going to cover today is a little bit about 3.0 uh, as a platform, particular software platform, um, hybrid services. Talk a little bit about the difference between hybrid and smart TVs. There's been some questions about um, more of a custom uh, customized experience and. Uh, what we found with, you know, with regard to TV, the TV interface. So when I came to uh, NAB, we were v very much down the HBB TV path. We wanted ATSC3 to basically align, uh, at least I was, that was during that time, wanted to align with HBB TV. Then we decided, you know what, we should go in line with the, with the web, <laughs> with W3C. So uh, we made, I wouldn't call it a left turn, but a right turn towards the, I think it's the right turn, uh, toward, towards the web. And so the interactive components in ATSC3 now is very much aligned with web. Uh, and you're going to see more and more of that. And, and, the, and, and the, what's good about that, um, as I go into some of the examples, I'll talk a little bit more, but most of, the, um, most of our broadcasters have a digital group. And that digital group or those digital groups are very, very familiar with web technology. Right? So by aligning those two together, I think it really going to help us move forward more rapidly in terms of providing better experience and better uh, services leveraging this technology. Hybrid TV and smart TVs. So you know, smart TVs are sort of a two world. Right? Where you hear a lot of talk about smart TVs, well, there's a lot of smart TVs out there. And what, what is the difference? So smart TVs is essentially you got a TV that has some, like a browser or has some software in there, but it's completely decoupled from the, the over-the-air television. You're either in one mode or the other. They were never designed to work together. Uh, so when we think of hybrid TV in the case of ATSC 3.0, we're really talking about a technology or a platform that was designed for the OTA and the OTT side to work together. And customized experience, I think, so, so ATSC3, is, it's a great platform for, for broadcasters to experiment with. Right? One of the things that every industry, I came from the cable industry, I, I did a lot of work on uh, the predecessor to the Comcast Xfinity. Uh, one of the things that everyone's looking for is, do I have a platform that I can start to experiment with? Because I don't know. No one knows the answer. No one knows what the killer app is, right? Everyone is in search of the killer app, but you're never going to get there if you don't do some experimentation. If you want to do experimentation, you need a platform to do that. And so uh, a lot of my pitches here is going to be about using 3.0 as that platform for broadcasting. So one of the easiest things, so, so what we did was we started to do a whole bunch of proof of concept this, several years ago. What is the easiest thing to do, right? A weather app. Right, so we got OTA coming here, and then we have a platform that's running. And this is a broadcaster application that is presenting, presenting the, the, the weather. And why this was easy for us to choose is because the broadcaster already had all this information on, on the digital side. And it was, so it was a really simple, it was very simple for us to basically take some of the work that's done on the digital side and bring it over to sort of the traditional side 
under a 3.0 uh, in the 3.0 platform. So this was a very simple, um, um, you know, simple thing for us to do and to prove out. Speaking of alert, so <laughs> back to A1, uh, and, and again, this would follow uh, Mark. Um, so on that note, we, the, the, uh, the software that we have worked with Trivini on is available today. You can, uh, it's available to all of our members. Uh, you can just go and download it from our website. And for those who are not members, like a consultant or, or someone like that, you can actually still get access to the software as long as you have a, one of our members sponsor you. So, so that's and it is a soft, it, it's it's uh, under an open source license, and we really want people to to use it, play with it, and provide feedback. And uh, we think it's a it's a it's a good start starting point. Uh, here's another one that we worked with A1 on. Um, we did quite a bit of uh, work on on this one because again we, we leveraged the design that A1 uh, did a lot of research on, and here. The way this will work is that you can, as a, as a user, you can actually navigate through the screen. So if you want to look at, uh, the, uh, you, if you want to look at the different components here, you can actually navigate just by using the uh, left and down, up and uh, left, right, select. And we wanted to, to uh, we want the navigation to be very simple. So this is really more or less a five button on the remote control. And those five keys are uh, left, right, up, down, and select, or sometimes is enter, depending on the remote control. I'll talk a little bit more about that. This, this, this is where it gets confusing. There are some people use select, some people use enter, some people use OK. And, that, well, you know, and so these are some of the things that we will work through. This is, um, but yes, it's, uh, uh, we, we had the fortunate, or un, the fortunate opportunity to actually do some, do some work with WRL and NBC for the 20, uh, 2018 Olympic. And so this is an example of proof of concept that we did where this screen here on the, I guess to your left, is basically an on-demand where that content is coming from the Olympic website itself where you're able to actually get access to content that are you know, pre-recorded or uh, more like of a catch-up type of TV. And then on the, the on, on your right side there, we actually uh, have the ability for you to track the countries, track the, how many uh, the medal counts, um, track your favorite athletes, how they're doing, which events are in, they're in, right? And uh, so this was a this was a very interesting. We we worked with a company that had a lot of data uh, stats for for the Olympic, and we were able to actually pull those uh, stats in live during the time during the Olympic. You could see that the medal count goes up on each country, and you know, and so forth. Um, but this is also another good example of what I call, what we call a hybrid service. So some of this stuff is coming over the air, and some of this, a lot of this data is actually coming from the broadband side. Here's, a, here's a, a, another one. We work with Fox. Um, so this, the football game over here basically allows you to view the game using different, uh, different camera angles. So Fox usually, what they explain to me is that they usually uh, uh, have about 11 cameras at the game and uh, you know, at, uh, during, uh, uh, during the game. So you could actually select, at least in this particular case, we would actually use a, the arrow to toggle between, select between different cameras and you'll get a different view. So here you're actually getting the view of the game, but if I scroll down, I can actually get the view of the coach. You know, so the coach will pop up there and so forth. And over here is uh, is a uh, NASCAR where you can select the different driver. You want to you see uh, the information from the cockpit because uh, the, the the car actually has a front and a rear camera, and you can actually see what he's seeing or what behind the car. And you can select different drivers, and you can also go back toggle back to the to sort of the, the overall the main race. So yeah, we heard uh, we heard, we heard uh, Rick talk about the target advertising. Of course, I got to talk a little bit about targeting content, right? We call it targeted content, but that could be content or advertising. So what we did in terms of our pr proof of concept was because Facebook actually have a really good way of 
uh, supporting um, uh, developers. So what we did was we tied into the Facebook development environment, and we created some accounts, and based on whose profile is selected, when you turn on your TV, then we are able to pull the information directly from Facebook, and that gives us some basic information that Facebook is, that, that's allowed in the Facebook profile, right? things like where you live, your uh, zip code, and things like that. Now, so there's, there are some uh, privacy issues here. Obviously, we are aware that those are things that we have to overcome, but for our proof of concept, we use Facebook because they already took care of a lot of that stuff. So based on, so for example, here, based on the, your Facebook profile, so imagine this is two TVs. You would actually end up, you know, household one would get one content versus household number two. So what I'm trying to show here is you got, you got two households that's in the same DMA, but because of their interest and because based on the information that we got from Facebook, we're actually presenting them with two different content. Right. And this could easily be two different ads, for example, or it could be two different whatever else, which is called a content is more of a generic uh, term. So interface, let's talk about that a little bit, right? So what we discovered through all of this uh, proof of concept with that, that we've done is that trying to navigate with a remote control is quite challenging uh, because every remote control is different at least as far as uh, what I can see today, and I'm sure that you all have the same experience. And this also leads to what Pete is talking about in terms of having a common framework. Um, so that's gonna be something that we will have to figure out as we, as we uh, spend more time on, you know, with this platform and start to, to experiment. We're gonna to have to learn, uh, and, and we're gonna to have to, as an industry, come up with some common practice, uh, best practice for, for, you know, in a situation where you're using a remote control, a standard TV remote control, maybe a mobile phone is a remote control. Could be, could, could be something that we, you know, we experiment with because you have a little bit more flexibility if you had a touch screen. Um, the other thing is voice. I've been talking to a lot of the CE guys about doing something at the uh, NAB show using a voice interface. And, you know, I, I, Hopefully we, we can, I'm working on FinCons on that as a matter of fact. If we can pull all that together, hopefully you guys will all come to the NAB show to see what that will look like. So, so imagine this, right? If you're watching this and you have a voice control, you can say, hey, uh, show me uh, Earnhardt's view or show me Earnhardt's car. By the way, if you are a racing fan, they never say Earnhardt, they just call him Junior. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for those who are not in racing, you don't know that, but yeah, they'll never, if you say Darren Earnhardt Junior, they say, no, no, you say Junior. And then, yeah, no, it's a, it's a classic thing. So maybe we use AI. Now that we have a full two-way, uh, potentially two-way com uh, communication, you can use AI to figure out some of this stuff. And you say junior, and you'll know exactly what you're talking about, right? So anyway, so imagine navigating this. If, you, if we want to navigate this with voice, I can imagine a much better experience than trying to navigate with a remote control. Because I have to hit so many keys in order to get to each one of, you know, of the views. Uh, and then I have to figure out how to back all the way out again to the race. And so I think that voice uh, has a lot of promises for us uh, in terms of this platform. But these were, you know, again, these are all things that's so going to be a little bit down the road. So in summary, um, after all the experiment we did, I, again, I think my, my uh, purpose and my intent for this presentation was really to encourage all of you to, to do more experimentation with 3.0. 3.0, I think it's a great platform. It is, it has, there's a big web ecosystem out there. There's a lot of tools that you can leverage. We have uh, all of the proof of concept that we have done are, are available on our website, actually, to, all, to our members. Uh, that includes our pilot gateway, which is complete software stack, includes our, we, we have a proof of concept uh, framework as well. I mean. Uh, and that, that you can learn a lot from. Certainly we want to launch with you know, what Pro is doing. There, there's more of a product, ours is a POC, but it, for, for experimentation, I mean, certainly there's a lot to, that you can learn from. Uh, so that's sort of the end of my, my, uh, my spiel. Thank you very much. Well, I think we're out of time. Okay. Um, yeah, we as expected, we ran out of time here. Um, we're toward the end, but we're cutting into a break.
So uh, if you want to ask questions, um, feel free. Uh, but realize you're cutting into your break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, up to you. Sugar in there. <laughs> is, is, is there a way to read the uh, manufacturer and model number off the TV so that you can customize the content based on the model? For uh, example, in the remote, you know, say enter instead of OK. Uh, yeah, actually, there is. There's actually a. Uh, there is a way to get that device info. There is an API for that. Uh, but we also did standardize a set of keys, so you don't have to know specifically. And we worked with CTA um, to actually define <laughs> the five keys that So was talking about, plus a, a back key. I think is another one. There were six keys uh, that we came up with. Um, now, if you knew something about, but the problem with doing it like that, models change all the time. Things, you'd have to have this huge lookup table or go to the web and find out what all that stuff is, right? And that's not really not available very easily. Uh, so just as we add more and more to the standard, we may add voice information, we may add stuff like that to allow us to genericize all receivers and get to a more usable user experience. That's, that's really the goal. Anybody else? Wow, you really do want that break. <laughs> <laughs>